Yes, it has. Okay. Hello. Welcome back to Drinks with MJ. It has been a minute, guys. I know, I know. It's a new year. This is the first interview, and I've got a very, very, very special guest. You know, you know the show, you know what it's all about. There's no drinks without MJ. It is, it's an evening, so I'm allowed. I'm joined with a vodka and diet coke, and my guest has already started. <laughs> Love it. I am joined by Channel 4 Pack Lunch Doctor, Dr. Hussein. Hello, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me on. Excited to to be on, chatting to you. Thank you. Well, you know, there's only one rule on drinks for them, Jay. A drink is compulsory. What are you drinking tonight, please? Well, uh, unfortunately, very boring. It's just water. So um, so it's it's nutritious, but just water. It's a drink. It's a drink. Cheers. Big swig before we start. I like it. I like it. <laughs> So we first met. I've been I've been on trade on sex pack lunch now for a year, and we first met on my live TV interview last week. As you guys know, I was on sex pack lunch last week, talking all about my sugar addiction, how I lost eight stone, and I've been addicted to sugary drinks for a, the majority of my life, and I'm now three years sugar free. You know all about it. And what I was so fascinated about about you was you also have had problems with food you've had problems with binge eating and it's so refreshing to actually talk to someone and who goes you know and open up to someone who has actually been through a similar journey to you you know you were 14 stone you've turned your life around it really is remarkable what you've done yeah no for sure like when when the topic came up that we were going to be discussing uh this i think it was, it was last week wasn't it um it really sort of resonated. I sort of I remember reminding myself of where I was over six years ago, and a point where yeah, no, I was very much overweight, very sedentary, and had a really unhealthy relationship with food. It was just a way for me to cope. You know, whether it was I was working too hard, your solution would be ah, oh, let me grab a takeaway, or or let me have a grab another can of coke, or you know, let me have a muffin, a cookie, or it was anything, and. For sure, it works to relieve the stress at the time and you'd feel good in the evening just trying to detox. But it was just having this cumulative effect where, you know, like I remember that the, the moment that I suddenly realized that I had a big problem um, was was when I was, sort of, I was diagnosed essentially with what's called fatty liver disease, which is where you've got fat, not just the stuff that you can see visibly, but it can actually get into your organs. We call that visceral fat. And when it gets into your organs, that's when you're, you're having problems, you know, and, and the liver was starting to struggle. Um, and it was just a massive wake up call because I'm not an old guy. And suddenly being told that you've got fatty liver disease, it just it just blew my mind and, and it really frightened me. And then that's where I went on this journey, which is don't get me wrong. It was not overnight. It was six long, hard years. What do you think contributed to the excess eating, putting the weight on your lifestyle? What do you think? Because I know you speak a lot of well about like mental well-being, and that's why this conversation, I really wanted to do it, because you're not just a GP, you're not just a doctor, and I don't mean just what you do is unbelievable work, all our doctors do, and we're so, so grateful. But what struck me is the the passion and the lifestyle. You know, you, you just, you be on the desk, aren't you? You go out there, you're out there in the public, getting people walking, getting people talking, whether it's swimming, running, you really do it all. Where did that come from? It came from trying to work out where I was. And, and, and sort of personally, I went on a mission of essentially educating myself because it will be a surprise. I'd done six years of medical school, but you don't really get taught much of anything on nutrition, on physical activity. And, and often there's a perception that you do. Um, and that's a massive shame because I think we should. And there's definitely a big drive now. And I'm supporting a lot of charities and to try and get education in early at medical school. But it was learning from the process myself because I'd spent my life academically trying to strive, trying to do the best I could, always get top grades, etc., and I never applied that kind of learner mentality to my own lifestyle. Like if you asked me what's the best thing to eat, you know, how do you get started with exercise? You know, I, I would have been, I was clueless. So I decided to change my focus instead of reading journals about, you know, other stuff, let's say for example, medication on whatever, I decided to start exploring the science of lifestyle to just from a very selfish perspective to, to fix myself. 
to go to a place where I was to where I am now. And it was lots. And what I realized is just it's lots of small things. It's not about just like one magical thing you do one day and suddenly you've unlocked this sort of secret. It's not like that. It's lots of small little things. And it's about firstly, I understood why I was doing what I was doing, why I kept eating, let's say, six packs of of um, uh, of crisps rather than just the one. Um, and and it's just removing that guilt from myself because I used to think that I was just a bad person, that I had no control, that I was a failure in that respect. And then starting to realize, oh, actually, this is how we're how we're designed. And if we don't, if we're not careful, we can fall into these traps. And it's not because you're a bad person, but it's just because that's how we're designed. And and everything around us is is trying to work to get us onto these things and obsessed with these things. Yeah. How yeah. do you think this lifestyle that you lived pre six years ago affected your work then as a doctor? How did you know this weight, this liver condition? How did it affect your practice today? The thing is, yeah, like the, the, the liver problem was silent, you know, like it's it's something that you, you don't get symptoms until it's too late, essentially. So like I, I was only found out to have it because as a doctor, we often have to have blood tests in order to check our immunity to stuff and make sure that we're protected against certain diseases. If you're doing procedures that could risk you getting blood on blood contact. Um, and yeah. it's just one of those blood tests that it just found my liver was inflamed and it was just all a bit strange. And so they, they did the scan. And so in a way, I kind of needed that scan because if you asked me before, what's your health like? I said, it's good. You know, I was I was getting around fine. Like I, I didn't I didn't feel like I was unhealthy per se. Um, but it was just because I was kidding myself. I wasn't really looking at at the reality of the fact that I was extraordinarily unfit. Um, like, I mean, going upstairs, like you just don't realize it then. But then, you know, once I started getting fear, I realized that like, wow, actually being breathless, doing one flight of stairs, that's not normal. You know, yeah. that's not right. And and that sort of process of realizing that, OK, I had to get to a point in time. And my first goal was just, OK, your first goal is just to lose one kilo. That's all I decided, because I'd, I'd seen so many people and from all the education that I was doing and understanding why people struggle to lose weight and sustain weight loss it's because often they sort of they go for it and they go that's it I'm going to lose 10 kilos or I'm going to lose three stone or whatever it is and that's really hard to achieve and it, and if you do achieve it it takes a long time um and so I realized that I didn't want to fall into those traps so I just said okay just lose one kilo that that's that's your goal to achieve and just lose one kilo and, and I ach achieved that one kilo and then I thought okay lose another one kilo um, and I just kept working on that front and just looking at how each time I went to lose another kilo, I would try to do it in another way. So let's say the first way would be I'm going to try and cut out Mars bars in the evening. That's it. That's all I did. I, I still ate badly the rest of the time. But my first thing was just, just cut out a Mars bar in the evening and I would achieve that and it would work. And I just keep maintaining it. And then the next job was, OK, let me. Instead of using um, uh, getting patients just from my room to the waiting room, which was literally a few meters, we have an upstairs and a downstairs. Let me get the patients to sit downstairs and then I'll go down the stairs, call them. They then come up with me up the stairs. And then you have to do that, what, like 40 times a day. So now I'm suddenly doing 40 stairs up and down. Um, and it, I haven't had to take time out. I haven't had to you know, book a workout. I haven't had to pay for gym membership. That was my next little step. And then slowly and slowly, I put these little steps over and over again. It starts to become addictive. I started to be like, oh, what's the next step? You know, well, what is the next little thing that I can do to a point now? And it's it's not in a sense that I want to brag or anything like that. But I've gone from someone that couldn't run 100 meters to now a, you know, an, a, it sounds crazy to say, but an athlete. So like an actual athlete. Yeah, with a license an athlete. And, and, you know, this May, I'm going to be doing the World Championships in triathlon representing Great Britain. And if you asked me six years ago, like, it still doesn't feel real, if I'm being honest. It still doesn't feel real. But it just shows that often if you make enough consistent little steps, you will achieve something remarkable. But if your goal at the beginning, let's say six years ago, was I want to, you know, be a, a triathlete, then you're going to lose your willpower before that's achievable. Does that make it's sense? Great. And congratulations on what you've done. It, it truly is remarkable. Congratulations, the way you've turned your life around and you're working in the community, getting people out walking. What I really wanted to talk about, because I've lost the eight stone and I was a sugar addict and we've got similar lifestyle changes, 
Yeah. Walking was my, I walked every single day. I still walk now. And I think getting out there in the open air is really good for your mental health as well. You know, sometimes sitting indoors, we're thinking about stuff, we're thinking about dwelling. What is it about the outdoors that makes us just feel healed? Just, you know, does so much for us. What is that? That's spot on. Do you know what? They they sent me um sort of your brief, you know, Steph's back lunch, just to sort of a bit about your story. And and what what the research actually didn't realise, and when I was reading through, I was like, do you know what? She walks every day. Like, she, she's a regular walker. That's... That's the superpower that she's acquired from all of this. Forget the from the consumption perspective. That's the most important thing. Um, and no, you're absolutely right. Walking is a beautiful thing in so many ways. And when you do it outside, in particular, if you can find some form of nature, whether it's a park or a local forest or even just around some greenery, it's been shown to have physiological changes. Your body will adapt. And what I mean is that when the eye, for example, sees green and that hits its retina, you get positive hormones being stimulated in your brain. OK, when you are hearing sounds of nature, when you are feeling the touch of natural landscapes, it's a way that the brain is trying to understand and promote survival. Because if you were the kind of creature that spent a lot of time moving through nature, then you're more likely to find food. You're more likely to find shelter, water, etc. So the brain always wants to try and stimulate a survival advantage. If you were the kind of creature that just stayed in the cave and just sat there and was like, no, this is this is good for me. You weren't going to survive because you're not going to find all those key things that you need for life. And so walking absolutely was another gateway thing for me. You know, that's the first thing I tried. You know, I was too big to start running. You know, it's, it simply it wasn't safe. Like I would have got an injury. And I started off by just walking regularly with my wife and we still do it now. So even now, even if I do a run or a cycle or a swim or a strength session, I will walk. And 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 you alluded to the sort of groups that I do in the community. I want to try and teach people this superpower as well. So we run something called Walk, Talk, Walk, which is a mental health support group where we're going for a walk and we're having a really good chat, just just a standard chat. You can moan, you can celebrate stuff, you can you can just share things. And what I find is that when you're talking to people that let's say aren't your family or aren't your really close friends, you can sometimes have even more powerful conversations than 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 otherwise because you don't have to worry about the judgment. They don't know about the previous baggage in history. You can just have an honest conversation. Um, and it's just so powerful. And people often think that I do it to support the community, but I do it mainly because it supports me as well. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> yeah. amount of like unloading and sharing and just feeling connected with people that I get from those sessions. It's so rewarding. Like, you know, I, I, I'd happily pay to go to them, let alone put yeah. them on for free. I was doing the same, but I was putting my headphones in and music on and all my classics that I like, all the 80s, and, and I was just going for it. And I feel being outside and listening to the music and every step of my feet, I was going to the music and I loved it. And what else I did as well, like, I could, obviously, I couldn't go shopping every single day, but I'd go to, like, my local supermarket. This was in the early days of my transitioning. A lot that you say, it's all about holistic lifestyle therapy. And I'd buy, say, two bottles of fizzy, uh, fizzy sugar-free water, and I'd just carry that in one bag each. And, you know, to get, like, the arms cardio, so I'd carry it as I was <laughs> yeah. walking. And I think these little hacks that we do, you know, they're, they're all out there. You know, anyone can do them. And I think that's what's so important with Run, Talk, Walk. And yeah, another yeah. incredible thing that you do in life is swim England. Tell us mm. all about that, because that's a great exercise, isn't it? Oh, no, totally. And... The, the special thing about swimming is that it is really accessible. Water will remove a lot of the issues that you've got. For example, let's say if you are carrying extra weight or you do have joint pains, etc. Water will, is very kind to you in that respect, while also providing you with more resistance. Because even, for example, let's say if someone doesn't know how to swim, I'll often recommend patients just to go to the pool and walk up and down. Because trust me, that's tiring. You know, it really will tire you out. You'll notice after a while, it's like, wow, okay. Like, I'm not getting the impact on my knees because maybe I struggle with osteoarthritis or et cetera. But I'm still getting a good walkout that's safe and that that I can connect with. And 
So I work with Swim England as a clinical advisor. They have a number of clinical advisors in different fields of medicine and in, in fitness and healthcare. And our aim is to help those that need it most to be able to access the water safely, um, removing some of the barriers, whether it be, for example, multiple sclerosis or someone that has agoraphobia and really struggles to get out of the house. So like I have to admit, Swim England are incredible and the focus on trying to not, not get the athletes faster. The main focus is getting people that wouldn't even contemplate entering the water to get into that water and feel safe and to feel that they've got a place. And there's this program which we call Water Wellbeing, which is where we are training the lifeguards, the gym staff, etc., to understand how to approach different patients, whether they have Parkinson's disease um, or they struggle with their weight, they can know the right things to do and the best way to guide them. Because what many will struggle to do is they maybe, let's say they get to the pool, they'll get motivated and they can do it, but they just don't know what they're doing. They, they feel out of place and they feel unsure. And we don't want people to feel like that. They want We want them to be supported so that they can get the most out of that experience. Well, that's wonderful. Another incredible, incredible thing that you're doing. That's fantastic. I know that you said, I want to go and take it right back to the start now. I know that you said that you're one of your influencers to get into medicine and be a doctor was <laughs> Dr. Carter. My yeah. last name, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Carter, I hear you, I hear you. So ER, so you grew up watching ER and you were really influenced by that. What was it about ER that really, really influenced you to be where you are today? Ah, do you know what? Like, I think when I was watching it, so it would have been like year 11 kind of time, I guess. What were we? We were maybe like 16 years old, maybe 15 years old. I think something back then that I struggled with was kind of sort of that kind of confidence in order to to sort of be myself, you know, to, to not have to be something else. Um, you know, I'd spent a lot of my life and uh, don't get me wrong, my parents did some fantastic things, but it was just such a drive on just achieving academically and and everything that was down was the result. It wasn't about the kind of person that you were or 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 that kind of thing. And so, like, I just felt that I couldn't really express myself if I went down the route that kind of was where it was heading, which was an engineering route. My parents are both engineers, just engin like the whole family is. And I just felt that I was kind of different. I've always loved connecting with people. I always loved just understanding what made them tick. I always would ask why to people, like, oh, why did you do this? Why did you do that? I just couldn't, I just was so intrigued by how people operated. And so when I watched ER and I saw all these sort of, you know how they were often, the patients would have a side story, like a reason that they're there. The doctors as well would like, you could see how they could make a difference in how they connected with people. And, and Carter in particular was a very empathic doctor and and yeah. really was very good at connecting both with his colleagues and with his patients. And I just was like, do you know what, I want to do that. Like that's a way that I could combine my love of academia with also my love of humans and, you know, and how they work and, and just being interested. And so I'd, I'd watch that and I'd be like, I want that. I want that job where possible. Um, so that's where I sort of made a sudden change. And it was literally like an 11th hour kind of change on the application to university where I was just like, okay, that's it. You know, I'm switching to medicine. I even kept two engineering um, applications on because you could apply for six universities and two of them were, were engineering. The other four were medicine just because I still like just had a part of me going, oh, God, is this the right thing to do? Um, but it was really was like, as late as that. How was your family's reaction when you had this like, light bulb moment in your life? Do you know what? Like, it, it wasn't as bad as if I suddenly said that, like, I want to do something completely non-scientific. Like for them, like medicine was, kind of, it was okay. Like it was like, yeah, that, that that's possible. Like it's definitely scientific enough. But I think they would have probably preferred if I went down um sort of a more maths or physics or based route that was definitely where academically I was strongest um and so it's just felt like a bit strange like but you know you're so good at maths so good at physics like there isn't really that much of that in medicine that's more focused in biology chemistry that kind of thing um so and I think like it was better than if I turned around and said I want to be like an interpretive dancer or stuff like that that would have been <laughs> like end of story that would have been you, you wouldn't see me again um but uh, but yeah no, they're definitely surprised I'll give them that that's really good. So tell us about Pack Lunch then, like your how you started on the show. Tell us all about it and what you do on the show. Yeah, so it was, it was a bit of a strange one on how I started. 
Um, I got a phone call from the receptionist. I was, I was working as uh, the duty doc on the day and uh, she rang and she said, oh, saying, by the way, like there's, there's someone called Jess and she she's from Steph's Pack Lunch. And I'll be honest with you, like I'm working during the day. So I, d- I had no idea what this program was. So and I didn't understand what like would be a packed lunch. You know, like are they like talking about the kind of food you should put into your lunch? Like what 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 is this yeah. thing? <laughs> and so I told her, I was like, do you know what? I'm I'm busy. Like, don't worry about it. Like it doesn't sound like it's important, you know. Um, and I, I said that, you know, just give her my email. If they really want to, they can they can email me. And so I got an email from Jess. Um, and I was like, oh shit, it's a TV program. <laughs> Crap, you know, because I, I love presenting. I've done a lot of work sort of teaching and educating um clinicians and medical students. And so this was a fantastic platform. So instantly I saw the email, I was like, shit, you know, like reply back. Sorry, I didn't pick up your phone call. <laughs> um, and that's where we started at. The first program we did was on coughs and colds and COVID in particular. It was back in September 2020. Um, and like it was really exhilarating to be on the show and Steph was amazing because of course I was really nervous it was the first time I'd done anything sort of tv based um where it was going out live I'd done stuff with like regional BBC stuff and a lot of radio stuff but it was the first live tv broadcast um but it just it was so much fun to do and the whole team at the pack lunch as I'm sure you know they're just so supportive they're so fun you know there's no egos there and it was just it was just such a lovely experience and then when I was invited to come back I was kind of like oh you know this isn't just a one time deal like they wanted me again and then like it, it sort of built from there um and I think what they liked in particular was that angle that I come from with lifestyle like it's it's balanced because often people want to hear that don't they they don't want to just be like okay this is the disease these are the drugs like we want to hear what can we do for ourselves you know because we can yeah. also control so much about our health probably more than any clinician can do um a lot of it is down to what we do and so I think they like that aspect that I would often bring that in as, as the forefront you know on like the kind of foods we can eat the movements that we can do and I loved how you mentioned before that a lot of the stuff that you do isn't like going to a specific class yeah. I've got nothing wrong against that but it was just about trying to engineer movement into your every day like carrying the shopping you know like with the way that the world's set up now we've we've kind of removed everything. We have electric whisks, we have r- robotic vacuum cleaners, we have, you know, cars that will take us wherever we want. And we've re- engineered all the movement out. And yeah, it's stuff like that. Being able to bring that up on the show um, and have free reign to be able to talk about these topics, it's just so liberating. It really, really is. And it's, it's so important to know that like when I was going through my lifestyle transformation, I had no money. I was really was, excuse my language, but on the bones of my backside, like I had nothing. And I knew I had to change. And I, so that's why I thought, well, go out and walk because I could, you know, I could do that. It didn't cost any money. I could take my own time. I didn't have to go to a class or a gym. And I think doing these exercises, and it's just about having that knowledge and knowing that you can do that to make your change is yeah. so important. And being what consistent, like, isn't it? It's being consistent because yes. you can just go on that walk. You went on that walk over and over and over again because it's. I know people often want quick results, but after four weeks of doing what you're doing, there probably wasn't that much in the way of like specific results, but it's by doing this for such a long time and being consistent with it, that's how you got where you got. It's it's do you know what? It's been such a journey, and I'm so, so, so grateful. And that that's what that's the important message of our interview. It's just about being consistent and knowing that you can make it happen is so, so important. What advice? Dr. Hussein, would you give to anyone out there or people who are watching to someone who wants to either lose weight or, you know, come off sugar or give up fat or saturated fat or want to start a lifestyle change journey today? I never say diet, lifestyle change journey. What advice would you give to that person who doesn't, you know, doesn't have a clue, basically? Let's go. Let's be real. The key advice that I would give is that whatever goal that comes into your head now when you're thinking, I want to do this. Reduce it by 10 to 10%, okay? So let's say it's 100%, whatever the goal is, let's say you want to lose two stone, reduce it to just 10% of that and let that be your focus. Let something small and achievable be your focus because if it's too big and it takes too long to get to, you're going to lose heart, you're going to lose motivation and you'll stop and you'll quit. Instead, just 
aim for that tiny improvement because if you put these small steps one on top of each other you will get your staircase to success but you can't suddenly build that staircase overnight so start really small and every change that you make you have to say that okay that change that i'm going to do am i prepared to do that forever because these sort of fad diets and these sort of fad sort of programs etc if you think that you can't do whatever it is that you're taking up forever and want to do it and enjoy doing it then it's not going to happen so those are the two key bits keep the goal small that's not because you're being unambitious but just because you want to get to that point where then you achieve it because then what happens is is that it really helps your ego if you let's set that goal and let's say you wanted to lose one kilo or you wanted to start walking once a week once you achieve it you go well done ticked it up and often i'll write it down i'll have it all written in a journal like i want to do one walk a week tick done once you've achieved that, okay, what else can I do? Maybe I want to do two walks a week, or maybe I want to start doing more staircase, you know, going up and down. Whatever it is, just set it small and keep building. Just uh, once you've achieved that goal, cement it, move on to your next step. Okay. And maintain that bit. And you're now just adding on. And then you just keep adding on and on and on and on. And who knows where you'll get to. That's, you know, that's what I love, exactly what you've just said. When I decided to change my life, I didn't have no idea where I'd get to. I just knew I had to change and I knew I had to do something about it. So mine was weaning myself off sugary drinks. So I was consuming between seven sugary drinks a day. I started weaning myself off it, going to five, going to four, and then going to sugar-free alternatives. It's the same with the agoraphobia because I never went out the house for six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the lamppost outside my house and then I went, I'd done that every single evening, spent longer outside the lamppost and then went to the nearest car, held onto the bonnet of the car for my life, <laughs> come back and just repeated this every single day. And as you relate, consistency is key. Another aspect of weight loss and lifestyle transformation I really, really want to talk about because when we were on Steph's Pack Lunch last week and I was talking about my journey and my lifestyle and my interview, one thing that I do that is so important is looking at the back of labels. I read my my labels. The traffic light system on our food is so important. And that's what I put out on my social media. Always read your labels know what is exactly going into your food why is this so important please it's because the the industry that's producing this food what is their main aim it's to sell as much of it as humanly possible and to do that they need to make the product as essentially addictive as possible now that's not their fault that's that's the system that they're built in they're not designed to make smaller profits and and save humanity from a health perspective their aim is just to make money okay and so what we, they will do is to whatever food they have, let's take a chocolate bar. They will want to make that chocolate bar as addictive as possible. And we know that to increase its addictiveness, the brain wants sugar, fat and salt. OK, so it wants those things, one, if not all three of them. And so how will they do it? They will, they will, they will essentially add sugar to products. So even if that product is designed with a certain amount, they will go, do you know what? One way that we can make people want this more is we just add sugar. So they'll add it in lots of forms, whether it be palm oil, uh, whether it be honey, um, they'll add these elements and then it will just produce a bigger response in your head. So when you eat that mass bar, you get that pleasure feeling. OK, you know, when we see the adverts for ice cream and, and the ladies eating the ice cream, she's getting that pleasurable feeling. We're even advertising that to you going, you know, if you have this product, you get this pleasurable feeling. And yes, it's short term pleasure. But the problem is, is that these things come with baggage and they will leave a lasting impact on your body in the form of weight gain, in the form of diabetes, et cetera, heart disease. And so be aware you need to look at the products because not all products are the same. And in the lifestyle clinic that I run with patients is we'll get an example. I'll say, look, you know, these are two chocolate bars. Um, Like any idea which one do you think is worse? And often they'll go, oh, I think it's that one. I think it's that one. And they always base it on how the branding looks. So like some will be branded and they'll look healthy. They'll be natural yes. and, you know, all these kind of things in them. And they'll be like, okay, well, this, this one's got this many grams of sugar. And actually this one's got a third of the sugar um and so that's why the only way you can truly trust what you're having is by looking at the traffic light system look at the 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 nutritional breakdown read for yourself how many grams of sugar 
And it can be a bit confusing at first, but then the more experience you get reading them, the quicker you go, oh, that's the kind of number I need to look for. So like a chocolate bar with, for example, 30 grams of sugar, that's just way too much. You'll start to realize, okay, I want to aim for more 10, nine, eight, if I do want to have a chocolate bar in my diet. So that would be my tip. Just start reading the products you're having, get used to looking at the traffic light system um, and don't rely on the marketing or the coloring you know, because they always put stuff as green to make it look healthier in the in the. Yeah. That's not. It may not be the case that that product is actually healthy. Doctor Hussein, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on drinks with MJ. It's been fantastic. Thank you for all that you're doing in the community work, and it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. No, thank you, and thank you for also you know sharing your story with the public because for for many they need these kind of genuine real life stories just to help give them that motivation that it can be achieved because don't get me wrong what you did is really hard to do so many people watching this may be like god i can't do this i haven't managed it don't be hard on yourself instead just listen to the key things that em said and that is consistency and be small okay um start with those small steps and you can see how you can get to somewhere very far but you can't fast forward four years or three years or whatever so live in that moment, make those small steps and just trust that if you maintain it, you will get there. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you. All the Thank best. you.